The president was meeting um, in Ottawa with his Canadian and uh, Mexican counterparts on setting up a goal of 50% renewables by 2025. And as you also know, the state has its rev for New York. How do you synchronize this? So let me just say, obviously, I work for the president. I think he's an amazing leader in climate and has done an incredible job of bringing other countries uh, probably they've done a better job of bringing us to the table, that's a better way of saying it. But it, there have been some incredibly exciting international announcements in the last couple of months. Um, so you have hit on the crux, that's sort of the challenge. We wanna move as fast as possible while ensuring that we have all the appropriate environmental safeguards in place. And so most of BOEM is about balancing competing interests, whether it's commercial fishing and wind or whether it's in, you know environmental and speed, and I, I don't mean to say that disparagingly about the environmental process, but um, I think what, what would be helpful is if we continue to have public input, because public input implies public buy-in, and public buy-in helps your elected leaders feel comfortable that they are, um, that they have some uh, support amongst their constituency to do this. So this is big, bold, different way of doing business. Um, Part of the reason why there's so much environmental analysis is because, as I said, these are huge pieces of infrastructure in your ocean, in our ocean, and so we need to make sure that we're, we're considering all the impacts of what that might be. So um, I, th I know there are some folks from the state here as well, and I'm not gonna put them on the spot now, but if you find them later, w there's lots of coordination between trying to align their REV process, the president's climate process, and our regulatory process. We're always open to, to ideas about how to make it better, but I can assure you that there's lots and lots of interaction on all of those. I'm with the beloved Earth community of the Riverside Church in Manhattan, and I'm for offshore wind. Um, we've, there's been so much talk about climate change and about doing something, and yet um, it seems like action is so slow. I'm glad to see that you know, the process is initiated here, and I, I just want to <laughs> sort of argue for you know, moving as quickly as possible. I mean, we, we keep seeing the destructive effects of climate change with the floods in West Virginia, the, the fires in the West, and who knows when the next superstorm may hit this area. And so it's just important somehow that we get off fossil fuels and move to renewable energy. And the other, other thing is, is that uh, those who are workers who are being displaced from, from fossil fuel jobs um, be given chances to uh, to learn new skills and to participate in, in this industry. And I'm wondering um, if uh, there are plans somehow for retraining or that would be combined with this offshore wind um, that would allow workers to, uh, local workers, not workers brought in from elsewhere, but to, to have decent employment. So uh, I just want to encourage uh, Bohm to work as fast as possible and um, that we can really get something concrete on the, on the ground or in the water, actually, um, for, for offshore wind. Thank Great. You. Th thank you very much. I, I don't know if, um, if there's any, any thoughts around um, this training question that I, I'd just like to, um, uh, in response, I think that's a, a great point, uh, especially about the, uh, uh, the, the movement from fossil fuels to renewables and the industry itself is uh, is recognizing that, and I want to note that the uh, uh, the first offshore wind farm uh, in in the United States, Rhode Island, uh, is using foundations. Jack is built down in in Louisiana, which is using the technology from the oil and gas industry and applying it to the development of the wind industry. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Good, thanks, thanks, Jim. I have a question that's really a very basic question, and Abigail may know more than may know from experience. When we see this as a public space, offshore land, like our national parks, belongs to the nation, and there are bidders to use and lease this land, is there any requirement that these bidders be in any way um, American companies, companies based in the United States, or could a company from Saudi Arabia decide to build offshore wind farms in our country? It may sound a little paranoid, but I do feel that since this is public land, it should be for the profit 
of the United States citizens. Okay, so are there, are there stipulations around uh, company ownership and, and nationality? There are, absolutely. We have three areas where we qualify companies before they can bid in a competitive lease sale. We qualify them legally, which would be, you're looking at citizenship. So they have to be American. They have to have an American office. They have to be based in America. So that is definitely a requirement. We also look at their financial capability and their technical capability. So it's a rigorous process, and that will be happening soon uh, as we receive. We've already qualified a number of companies. We'll be looking to qualify more as we receive more packages during this comment period. Jim. Let me just add to that. Um, uh, they do have to be American companies, that, which is what you're, you're addressing there, and, and, and that is a requirement. But at the same time, there are American companies that are taking advantage, not of Saudi Arabia, but uh, the expertise that we've learned from the European communities uh, and, and the work that they've done over, over there. They're very interested in helping us out. It's been a very productive uh, process, and they, and they are working with us on, on moving forward here in, the, here in the States. Thanks, Jim. And I'm very in supportive of offshore wind and it happening as fast as possible. And one thing I just have a question about, correct me if I'm wrong, but Aaron mentioned that once the site is leased, it would take approximately five years for site assessment. And I'm a little bit confused about why it takes five years just to do the surveying of the site by the company, never mind actually build them. Absolutely, very valid question. So in order to, to obtain the financing, for a full-scale wind facility, a company needs to have very good data to demonstrate that the wind is good and, and have knowledge about the wave conditions, for instance, and the, and the flora and fauna, mostly fauna in this, in this environment. So they need to have that information. They may not need all five years, but they certainly need to have some amount of time. So we, we've worked that into our regulations. They have a five-year site assessment term by default, but they can certainly submit their construction operations plan earlier. As a matter of fact, they could submit it at the same time as their SAP. There is the ability to do that, so. Thank you. I'm with SANE Energy Project, and we are so grateful to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for taking this historic step. Offshore wind power is a major leap forward for all New Yorkers and for our shared climate, and I just wanna say that we are 100% in favor of what you're doing, and I think so too are a lot of people here. Could I see a quick show of hands if you're here to support <laughs> offshore wind? There you go. So again, we're just so grateful that you're taking this step. I have a two-part question. Uh, what would the impact be for the timetable that you've described uh, of a long-term purchasing commitment for offshore wind power here in New York State? And procedurally, here in New York, uh, who would we turn to and what can we do to secure this commitment? Thanks, Abby. So um, I think there's three three legs of a stool, Patrick, to make an offshore wind project happen. One is you have to have the right technology, one is you have to have the right site, and one is you have to have someone to buy your output, right? So our job is to provide the right site, the industry is providing the right technology, and if, the, if there's some entity, be it a state, a city, a, a business that can provide a buyer, you're gonna, that's the magic recipe. Um, so it's sort of to Aaron's point about financing these projects, it's a lot easier to finance if you know someone's gonna buy your project. Whether it's a pencil factory or an offshore wind farm, if you have a buyer, it's gonna be a lot easier to get financing. So it would, I think it would impact the timing in terms of how much they would have to survey and sort of how long that period would be and the, the level of uncertainty. Certainly the developers in the room could probably opine about that a little bit better than I could. In terms of who you can lobby, um, I'm just an informed citizen. I'm not speaking as an official of the home at the moment, um, but I know that you have a, a proceeding happening in your Public Service Commission now, um, so it seems like that would be an appropriate place. Obviously, your governor and certainly your mayor uh, would all be good people to, to uh, hear your voice. Thank you. I'm the climate change uh, campaign organizer for the New York Public Interest Research Group, Nightperg. Um, thank you guys very much for having this event, and it's so um, thank you guys all for being here as well. I'm here absolutely, as everyone has said, to support the progress of this offshore wind facility 100%, and we encourage and really urge BOEM to accelerate this process as much as possible, and also consider what's going to be best for the communities and the environment. Um, this is something that's going to provide power for millions of 
people, um, you know, in the downstate area, Long Island and New York City. Um, but we really need to see uh, more aggressive action from BOEM on making this process uh, a lot more available to the public. And I'd, uh, my question is, I'd like to hear what are the plans to engage the public as you're seeking more input? I mean, these hearings that you've done uh, throughout June have been fantastic. Um, but what are the plans moving forward um, on how to engage the public? Um, what information will you be providing to the public and what ways uh, other than these hearings and the uh, comments period will you be looking for feedback and uh, kind of like a second part to that question is um, how does this also how will you also be engaging uh, New Yorkers upstate on this issue uh, so you know this downstate wind facility will provide your help us meet our statewide goals here in New York State great question okay so what we've done recently for leases we've issued off of other states is we hold a task force meeting traditionally after we've issued a lease. Uh, so we certainly will look into doing that, hold a, another New York task force meeting. And on the side of that, we could explore having a public information session if there's enough interest. We certainly want to hear if there's interest, So, and, and we're hearing it today. So we could explore that, basically to talk about what the next steps are, what does this lease mean, perhaps an opportunity for the lease holder to explain their plans. Uh, so that's certainly something that we have on the table as an option. When we have plans submitted to us, we make those public. As soon as we determine that they're complete and they have the full information that they need to have, we'll post those on our website and make them public. So uh, that plan would most likely be the site assessment plan would be th the plan you'd see first. And we could certainly have outreach associated with that as well. We're always looking to hear feedback from you on when we need to have meetings, how often, where we should go. So uh, it's good to hear from you that you think we should reach out in, in state and upstate, and we'll certainly take that into consideration. You are our best partners in getting the word out. You, we, are, uh, we are one source of information, but you have networks that, that greatly exceed ours. And so invite us to come. Come to your meetings, come to your events, come to your conferences, we will come. Good, thanks. I'm with the Sierra Club. Um, Director Hopper, we will take you up on that, so thank you so much. I can't wait to see you at the meeting. Um, so yeah, I wanted to start off, it's redundant at this point, but I did want to start off by thanking BOEM for moving this process forward and for really making New York a priority state for offshore wind development. As you can see, you have a massive base of support here. Use us, let's work together, let's make this happen. Um, you know, and we want to see this move ahead, as been said, as quickly as possible. Um, I appreciate, Aaron, that you said this is a thoughtful and deliberate process. Um, thoughtful and deliberate is good, but also climate change is an emergency. And I do my job under that premise at all times, and I would ask that you do yours as well under that premise. Um, thank you. Um, and thoughtful and deliberate is good. You know, six years to get to the point where we're talking about meteorological buoys, you know, maybe it's slightly less thoughtful and deliberate, maybe a little bit more on the speed side. Um, and taking uh, Director Hopper's suggestion um, to lobby the state and the mayor, we're with you on that. And I might as well start here. I know we have some state reps in the room. Um, and we really need to see the Cuomo administration step up and meet Boehm's ambition here. Um, you know, it's, it's worth acknowledging and it's great that NYSERDA has bid into this auction. It's a good first step. But we need a large-scale, long-term offshore wind program from the Cuomo administration that gets the whole industry to scale and ensures that this project isn't just a one-off, that we have a whole slew of projects coming online in the next decade. And that's what needs to happen if we're going to meet the state's climate and clean energy goals. Absolutely. Um, the last thing I'll say is I know there have been a lot of worries of, uh, from fisher folk about the impacts on, on marine fisheries. Um, and Sierra Club agrees we want this, you know, the, the proper research to be done to make sure impacts are minimized on fisheries while also being aware that at current warming trends, 30% of all species on Earth, marine and terrestrial, are threatened with extinction by the end of this century um, under current trends. And we can all agree that that is just an unacceptable eventuality. We cannot let that happen. Um, so BOEM, um, the state and the federal government can really be heroes here in stepping up and intervening in this way getting offshore wind to scale. Um, BOEM and President Obama have already shown their commitment, and everyone in this room who has taken hours out of their evening to come here tonight is looking to the Cuomo administration to step up its ambition and really get that program off the ground. So I will step off my soapbox now and end with a question, 
which is, um, are any non-monetary factors being taken into account in the auction lease of this area, um, particularly with regards to um, looking at um, looking for bidders that have a demonstrated record of being good corporate citizens in terms of project labor agreements, et cetera. Great. Good, good question. So, Dan, thank you for your question. Um, at the time, the proposed sale notice doesn't have any specific non-monetary factors, but we are inviting feedback on that. What we've done is we've gotten feedback on the p possibility of considering a power purchase agreement term sheet. That's one comment that we've received to date. We'd be looking to hear more feedback on, on whether we should consider other non-monetary factors. Uh, are there mechanisms out there? And I will let Wright add to this, but basically we want to see non-monetary factors that are firm enough where they, we, if we're giving them a financial advantage, it needs to show developmental advantage. And it might be worth just saying a touch more of what, a, what you mean by the power purchase agreement, just so folks understand that. Oh, so as far as a power purchase agreement, you're, you're looking at offtake, you're looking at a, a promise to a, a legally enforceable contract to buy power for, I think, a long, long, long term for a power purchase agreement. I think we're talking 10 years. Um, that was, that's one that we've used in the past. If you have this power purchase agreement, uh, that demonstrates a real developmental advantage that you possess and that we would uh, consider. The non-monetary factors, the way it basically works is if you meet the criteria that we establish um, up to a certain percentage, that will, um, it'll act as uh, kind of a discount on what you need to pay for your bid. Um, and it's, it, it, so you'd pay partly, you'd be bidding uh, less cash because you'd have this other, um, you'd, because you'd met this criteria. Because it's worth actual real money to people, um, it's something where we want to be careful with how we structure it and, and not make it something that's gameable or that's not really worth what it seems to be. So we appreciate any, uh, we're, we're asking for comment on this. We also appreciate um, suggestions on how to um, implement it because these, when you're talking about fair labor practices, it's one thing to, you know, yes, we all, nobody's not in favor of fair labor practices. It's another thing to be able to come up with criteria that are either, you know, we look for things that are objectively identifiable um, and actually indicate a, a real advantage in developing the project. So to the extent that you can help us with that, uh, we would appreciate that very much. I work with 350 New York and also with the Win Wind Coalition and I'm here tonight um, as are most of us here in the room to support the massive building of offshore wind. And we actually, I wanted to say, we know that you all know as well as we know that our earth is in a severe crisis. Uh, one that I think humanity has never seen before. We're facing extinction of all species probably. And you know, things couldn't be worse. So while I am so encouraged and grateful for all the work that Bohm is doing on this panel, um, it's all a day late and a dollar short. And I think we all know that and we discuss this with that knowledge and that belief. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't proceed and that the impact work has to be done. There has to be a pace to this that makes sense and that it's developed in a, in a sane way. But I think as a number of people have touched on tonight, we're running out of time. And I think we all know that we're running out of time. So my question is, how do we all facilitate this to make this process happen in a way to avoid the horrible, unbelievable consequences that we're all facing? So Marilyn, thank you, thank you for your good work. Uh, and thank you for being so clear. Uh, I think I can speak for myself. I, sh I share your view of the urgency of climate change and the need to address it. And I think as a bureau, uh, as a bureau under the leadership of President Obama, um, we, we understand the urgency. Um, so to answer your question specifically about how we can best work together, I think building public education, public education about, about what's happening to our earth and sort of what these uh, options are, how offshore wind could be a part of the, of the uh, answer in the state of New York and in this country would be critically important. So however we can work together to, to get that word out will be important. Encouraging your members, your neighbors, your constituents, your friends, whatever category to, uh, to engage in this process with us. Give us comments. Tell us what we're doing right and what we're not doing wrong. I'm just going to be honest with you. Litigation is 
is a concern for us, right? We are, I'm, an, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also an informed citizen, and I know that people that don't like projects sue. And so part of, uh, part of what you are seeing is us balancing sort of some litigation risk versus urgency. And so um, that's just the reality of, of the world in which we live. And so um, some of our deliberateness is in sh inoculating ourselves in the long run against litigation delays. So uh, please keep thinking of ways that we can get the message out. We'll keep thinking of ways we can get the message out, but we're uh, glad to work together. I was born during World War II. That's how old I am. Um, but when World War II happened, the United States went into crisis mode. It converted, um, it converted auto plants into tank plants and built Jeeps instead of cars. I frankly don't see that kind of urgency in this matter. And I think that is critical that we move with some real urgency, and I appreciate all the issues about getting sued and everything else that you've properly raised, but uh, the, the issue, I mean, the issue, and I think our client scientists, climate scientists have been trying to shout this at us, the, the urgency with which we're approaching this does not measure up to the problems that we have and that we will grant, give, it, give on to our children, grandchildren, and their children if we don't move much more quickly than we're currently moving. Thank you. Thanks very much. From Surfrider Foundation, thanks for everybody coming out tonight. And uh, I did want to say thanks to Bohm for pulling the Mid-Atlantic out of the oil and gas leasing. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm mostly here at Grandstand, but I have a small question about data. Um, we collected some great data on recreation a couple of years ago, diving, beach going, um, surfing. And uh, just wondered if that data will be included in your analysis that you've already done or ones you're going to do in the future. It's all on the Mid-Atlantic Ocean data portal, so it's easy to find. So this is potential, Im Im potential impacts of wind energy on dive sites? Yep, dive okay. sites offshore, and also there's whale watching and bird watching uh, that goes on offshore. Thanks. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, we do use the data portal, so I would imagine that we have incorporated that into our environmental analysis and our planning analysis, but I certainly will uh, double check that for this particular um, environmental assessment and, and ones we do in the future. Um, our job is to use the best available information, so we certainly will make sure that's in there. I am here with Mothers Out Front. You guys can all see the t-shirt. So we support uh, mothers, grandmothers, and allies in the lead for climate change. Um, I want to reiterate my affirmation to Dan and everyone else who has spoken. Um, and I have one question that actually is posed from the gentleman who spoke first, and I don't believe it was actually answered. Um, so do you guys actually have plans to train or retrain local people or require this to happen for folks in our economy to have the ability to jump into this in, you know, um, in the future, in the very near future. Um, we love the fact that it's gonna be an American company, but American companies in Illinois and California don't do anything for local laborers in New York. Um, and I think the question was just kind of passed over, so I wanted to be very sure. That okay, and, and I think you've actually broadened the question a little bit. I think when it was posed first, it was around the ability to retrain oil and gas workers, and I think where you're focused is also on local workers. Yes, so, so let's, it's a two-part, I guess, yes. Let's give you guys a chance to weigh in on that. Sure, so Shamika, thank you for your question. Um, so I will tell you, as a federal agency that's leasing the land, that's not one of the things that we look at. Um, but I will tell you, as a person who lobbied in a state and passed laws in states, that was one of the requirements that we had for whoever gets the offtake agreement from the state of Maryland, was that they had, PL, it was not a requirement that they had P, uh, project labor agreements, but it was included. Uh, to someone's question earlier about PLAs. And then uh, there was an, a, net, a net economic benefit analysis. So it wasn't a requirement that they use state workers, but it was a, it, it's basically a calculation to determine what would the benefit to the state be, both from hiring workers, from infrastructure that's invested in the state, from state taxes, uh, and, and so that the, our public service commission in that state could balance those different requirements. So. Uh, I would say that that's probably a question more, uh, more appropriate for your state 
actors here to look at what kind of procurement and sort of what kind of um, benefits come to the state by having the benefit of that. I will, I will represent what I have heard from developers, though, just to be fair, that sometimes those local content requirements, you know, they can be more expensive. And so, like most of life, it's a balance, sort of where the right, where the right balance is. I'm a recent Hunter College alumni and a former intern with New York Public Interest Research Group. Um, so I guess my question is, is that for you guys when you've had these public hearings before, has, has there ever been a, a public hearing where you've met, been met with a lot of resistance towards um, wind energy or renewable energy and how have you guys, I guess, well, what was your guys' experience with that, or how have you guys countered that? Like maybe earlier this week? <laughs> so, um, I think that, like, no, 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 no it, it was off. Um, so, as we stated earlier, we had uh, five environmental assessment meetings prior to this, and uh, some of the locations we went to, we specifically went there because we had received concern from the fishing community. Um, so we, we, do, we do encounter um, a lot of really good questions and a lot of concern from uh, some communities that could be impacted by potential development offshore uh, New York. And so really what we, we try to do is we try to uh, give them uh, the best available information we have on, um, on what we know about uh, projects and kind of their spacing and how that may impact uh, the fishing community. But we're also there to hear from them, just like we're here there to like we're here tonight to hear from you guys. We also want the feedback from them um, so we know uh, what their concerns are and we can try to mitigate those concerns. So um, as a federal regulatory agency, we represent uh, everyone in the United States. And um, as a uh, environmental coordinator, it's my job to um, take everyone's uh, interests and everyone's concerns into consideration and, and, pr and try to provide that to our decision makers so they have a full picture of everything. So um, we certainly listen to um, all, the, all the feedback we get and all the criticisms we get. And where we can, we try to provide information. If they are saying something that's incorrect, we try to provide information to correct them. But if they're saying something that we don't quite know about yet or we're learning about, we certainly take that into consideration when we're doing our planning analysis and our leasing. Let me just let me just add to that uh, on on the fisheries co concern uh, specifically. We have heard from fisheries a lot, and they do have concerns, and they do have valid concerns. Uh, and we are trying to work with them to identify, as Brian says, the appropriate mitigation that can make these two things work together. But we're not hearing, as as your question was posed, opposition to wind energy. It's just making sure that we can address the concerns appropriate and identify appropriate mitigation. I'm a member of New York City Grassroots Alliance. I mean, to me, our coastlines seem like national parks. And if I'm leasing, or we're leasing, a huge tract of land to, let's say, an oil or gas company, and they're making private profit from that public land, how, how do we tax them? How do we get a public share from that money? How do you envision it? Maybe you could clarify your relationship in the, in, with the public lands question. Thank you. Great. Good, good, good question, and we really didn't talk too much about that tonight, right? No, we, um, we talked about it a little bit earlier today, but uh, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act requires us to obtain a fair return for the leases that we issue. So uh, less in exchange, not only is there, do they pay something to acquire the lease, there's also fees and rentals that come in um, on an annual basis after that for the duration of the time that they hold the lease. Um, and I, I can go into that more or less. Maybe we can talk afterwards a little bit on the specifics of, of, of the payments. Um, but there, there are payments that are involved. They're in oil and gas, they have royalties. Here, uh, there's operating fee payments and sort of analogous functions. I'm with United for Action and with New York City Friends of Clearwater. And I would like to very strongly agree with everything that's been said here tonight by the other speakers and very strongly applaud BOEM and endorse moving forward with this wind project as quickly as possible. And I'm also very glad that we have people here tonight from the state so that we can say once again what we said at the public service. 
um, which is that we'd really like to see a dedicated tier in the clean energy standard, specifically for offshore wind, um, to guarantee you know that the market will be here for this. The question that I'd like to put forward, since we know that we want to move forward with this much more quickly, is what can we do? Can we put some structure in place? Can we have a task force or an expediting procedure or a think tank from BOEM? You know that the environmental community will work with you. What is there that we can do to start the process? And I know that you have your concerns about litigation and concerns about making sure you know that everybody's concerns are met. And we certainly do want to make sure that this is done in a proper way. Um, you know, but like Gary said, you know, if there's an urgency, you get it done real quickly. So what can we do to make sure that happens? I uh, appreciate the comment for sure. Um, uh, and, and Abby kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, what we can really uh, benefit from is your, your continued support like we're hearing, like we're hearing and seeing tonight but also your use of, of existing networks of people uh, to become involved and stay aware and, and, and provide us the information that will keep this process moving along and identify the issues that are of, of, of greatest concern. You have a far more effective network in the affected community, particularly of New York, uh, than we can have in Washington, and, and that help is, a, is of great value to us. Citizens Campaign for the Environment. I'd like to echo everybody in saying thank you so much for holding these meetings and moving forward with Offshore Wind and your commitment to it as well. Um, I just want to express that I think there's been a little bit of frustration in the public for the last 10 or so years with this because it seems like not even just this particular project, but a lot of renewable energy projects are under this intense amount of scrutiny, whereas it seems like fossil fuel projects and just fly through. So we're looking at the better part of a decade for this offshore wind project. Meanwhile, a fossil fuel plant can go up in a year or two with far less environmental review. Um, and, uh, and especially knowing some of the climate change impacts on particularly squid and sea scallops, which I know you've heard from both of those, those are the two big fisheries concerned with ocean acidification. Is there a way to take into account the larger climate change impacts um, instead of sort of focusing on finding the exact perfect wind project to expedite this a little bit when we do the EIS. And we look forward to working with you guys on the EIS and making sure that, of course, there are no um, huge negative impacts to fisheries, marine or avian life. I think that all of the groups in the room agree on that. Um, but we don't want it to stall looking for the exact perfect wind project. We need Thanks. To now. So let me, let me the, you know, one, one piece on that question is long-term impacts. Is there a way uh, to sort of accommodate and consider long-term impacts, benefits of wind energy. Brian. So um, it's, this is kind of a, just a small part of the answer, but in, in our environmental reviews, we do look at cumulative impacts. Um, so we look at impacts from past, uh, present, and future activities, and then adding in uh, the impacts that we, our action would do. So that's kind of how we incorporate everything together. Um, we also do look at climate change as part of our our documents. Um, so it is kind of looked at there, but um, as far as the direct impact of our proposed action, we certainly um, still do have to look at the socioeconomic impacts to the fishing community, and that's something that will always be in our documents. And things such as um, potential climate change impacts on, on fishing communities, it, it might not be as, as easy to work those kind of into the document, but overall um, impacts from climate change is, is something that we, we do look at in, in our cumulative effects analysis. I'm here tonight thanks to my friends uh, in the Sierra Club and the Sane Energy Project. Uh, I'm a former lawyer and a current PhD student here in the city. Um, I was privileged last year to work as a legal advisor to the Marshall Islands during the negotiations that accumulated in Paris with the adoption of the agreement there. Um, climate change is not something that's going to happen in the Marshall Islands, it's something that's happening. Uh, through the negotiations I saw firsthand American leadership, uh, how important it is and how decisive it can be and how committed this administration is to climate action, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, that being said, as I think everyone in this room has, has emphasized, urgency is required. Um, and in that respect, I think the five year period sounds quite long. Uh, for the, the assessment phase. And I noticed that in 2014, BOEM 
uh, actually adjusted the length of time for the, for the prior phase and actually extended it from six months to 12 months. Um, so it's obviously possible to amend these regulations. So I suppose that begs the question as to why Bohm considers five years as necessary for that period and whether or not there's any possibility of amending that and potentially shortening it. Hi, thank you for that. The, uh, the five-year period is uh, a maximum, so it's, it's not that we're requiring five years for anything. If companies can come in before that amount of time, they could come in right away if they have it. Now, in, because these are very expensive projects, it's the project proponents that uh, I think want the, this, to use this time to gather data and find out and, and to work on the financing side of it. So um, the, I think that's the answer to the five, to the that sp narrow issue on the five-year question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let me put you on the spot and ask his question again. Um, so can it be changed, however? I, ju I just wanna add real fast, yeah, it can be changed. It would be changed through a rulemaking, um, which can be done, they're, they take time and they're complicated, but they, they happen. The regulations, when we did develop them, it was a, it was a multi-year process, and, and we did go out and get feedback on how long would be appropriate, and that five years was based on that. So it wasn't a number that we randomly came up with, I just want to assure you of that. But given a little more experience now, we've issued a few more leases, maybe it is time to re rethink that. But um, I, it was well thought out. I am with uh, Global Justice for Animals and the Environment, and I'm also an apprentice with International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 3, New York City. And so, this is what I wear all day. So, <laughs> I actually, I, I attended um, a forum a little while ago about the, about the Block Island site, and there were, there were uh, Local 3 people there who were really, who, who really keen on it, because they did use a project labor agreement. Um, and I particularly know I have colleagues who, who commute from Long Island to Manhattan every day because there are almost no jobs out in Long Island for, for these new people coming in. There's going to be a priority that these are people who, who work with unions, who are union shops, that kind of thing to really, to really make this an, an organized effort. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, I want to echo something that Abby said earlier. When we, when we issue a lease and we approve the plans, we, we typically look at how those plans would impact the environment. And so we do our consultations, we do our environmental impact statement. We normally do not get involved with labor and uh, looking at subjective characteristics of, a, of, a, of an agreement. But however, one way that you can you can voice you can you can voice your concern would be when the lease is issued even before the lease is issued making reaching out to the companies that are interested in participating in this lease sale having a relationship with those companies expressing your concern making them aware uh, that they should be working with the union that would be one way to do it it would be the lessee that you'd want to work with I'm with Sane Energy Project um, I want to compliment you on the EA I actually read it all and I thought the charts were fantastic and it seemed to me like the scallops and uh, the other fish were, were pretty well handled. So I think the fishermen don't have to worry. Um, but my question is um, two part. Um, you, you have already issued several leases, but only Deepwater submitted any construction plans. So is there any kind of deadline after the survey period for a company? Like what if they have a lease, but they never get around to bidding? We you know, obviously have a sense of urgency. And if you could also talk about uh, the role of NYSERDA in this process, how do they figure in, how are they different from other bidders, what can we expect in terms of that? Thank you. We do. We have a variety of diligence requirements built into our regulations. We want to see progress on the leases that we issue. So once we issue the lease and it's executed, say early 2017, there would be that 12-year, or 12-month, excuse me, 12-month clock uh, where they would need to submit their first plan. And then, of course, there's the five-year period as well. So those are our primary diligence requirements. We have a variety of other mechanisms we can exercise if necessary, if certain requirements are not met. For instance, if rent is not paid or a plan is not submitted, we have penalties that we can exercise. So 
we do, we do have different tools in our toolbox and we can ensure diligence on a lease because we don't want to see inaction any more than you do. Uh, could you repeat your second question for me? Sure. Um, I'm curious about the role of NYSERDA and how they compare to other bidders. Okay, they are, in Bohm's eyes, they are a bidder like any other bidder in that they are on equal footing with any other bidder. I'm the co-director of SANE Energy Project. Um, first, I just want to express my extreme gratitude for how uh, transparent and how inclusive this whole process has been. We um, fight shale gas industry typically and we're pushing for renewable energy so we typically deal with FERC so this process is amazing and like the fact that yeah we just really deeply deeply appreciate your inclusiveness you're sharing your contact info your commitment to joining us at meetings and being a partner with us in developing this so thank you thank you thank you um, because we typically deal with shale gas industry and trying to promote a renewable, equitable, you know, future for ourselves, we in New York City have um, our disproportionate members of our society dealing with the gas-fired peaker plants here um, that uh, fire up during the same times that offshore wind would peak. So. Um, who, what state agency would you recommend that we work with to make sure that offshore wind shuts down those dirty gas peaker plants and helps our environmental justice communities that deal with asthma? And um, how can we work together with you to make sure whoever gets the bid um, will address those concerns? And is NYSERDA involved in that um, you know, process? And like, how, do we, how can we communicate with NYSERDA to make sure that offshore wind shuts down the fossil fuel industry. Great, thank you, Kim, uh, for that. I, um, um, there are, there is lots of super interest, like if you're a total energy dork like I am, um, there are lots of really interesting models, dispatch models that look at kind of when offshore wind would generate energy, when peaker plants, are needed and sort of that replacement value. So that work is being done and I will tell you any developer in this room uh, is closely following and modeling that because that's, that's money to them, right? That, that's benefit, the, the, there's clean air benefit but there's also, uh, there's also monetary benefit for, for producing during those peak times. So I would think that um, I'm not an expert in New York New York regulatory construct, but my guess is the Public Service Commission, uh, in terms of approving any power purchase agreement that would happen, that kind of um, monetary benefit and air quality benefit would be incorporated into, ooh, into their modeling as they, as they approve those. And I think after that, the market, I mean, the market will take care of it, right? If there is a, if there is a uh, solution um, that will benefit air and, and be reasonably affordable, uh, I think that th that would take it. I don't know if anyone else has other things they want to say about air quality and economic modeling. In terms of your question about interfacing with NYSERDA, um, okay, my friends at NYSERDA don't get mad, but can you guys raise your hand? <laughs> okay. <laughs> See them right there? That's who you should talk to. <laughs> we'll set up a separate table for you guys now, okay?